Well, the conference was over in Melbourne. And I said my farewells and I caught the lift on the third floor of the RTC. Came out onto the street, walked a block to a set of lights. And just then a middle-aged woman approached me. Excuse me, can you tell me how to get to the Southern Cross train station? I've been using Google Maps and I can't work it out. And I said to her, look, I'm, I'm not a, a regular around these parts. I'm uh, interstate. Um, I'm probably not the right person to talk to. And uh, without a, a sort of a great deal of confidence, I, I said that I thought it was sort of up there. And I sort of pointed vaguely in that sort of direction. I said, at least it was up there yesterday uh, when I arrived from Melbourne, in Melbourne. Uh, so if you go that way and um, you know, walk along, I think uh, it's Spencer Street, I think it is, going that way. You'll see it, I reckon about five or 10 minute walk. I'm, Sorry, I'm not much help. She, she, she needed a local. Uh, she needed someone who knew the way to get into the station. And the person that you should listen to when it comes to worship is Jesus, who shows you the way to worship. He knows how we should worship. And he teaches in John 4 a woman he encounters at Samaria, from Samaria on the foundations of true worship. So why true worship? And last Sunday we saw that Jesus put an end to religion. The purpose of meeting in church to offer God worship isn't found in the New Testament. As people of the new covenant in Christ, we aren't like the Old Testament worshippers who draw close to some holy place on earth, like a temple in Jerusalem. We had to find a priest to meditate, or sorry, me mediate for us. Uh, we aren't making some atoning sacrifice like a bull or a lamb or a pair of doves. We, we don't offer the mass. We don't need to sing for half an hour to draw close to God. We are already close to God our Father if we have trusted in Christ. We aren't turning up to give God our worship. We don't go up to the house of the Lord. Jesus brought that whole temple system to an end. Jesus is our perfect priest perfect sacrifice, giving us perfect access by his perfect worship. Jesus entered heaven itself. And so our emphasis isn't on our worship on earth, but on Christ's in heaven. And we have confidence to draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. In John chapter 4, we have three foundations for how we do truly worship. And John has already shown us in the gospel that Jesus is the true tabernacle of chapter 1. Jesus, the true temple in chapter 2. Jesus is the true light sent by God for the world in chapter 3. And in Jesus' encounter with this Samaritan woman, we see him defining how to worship God. It's a story that's familiar, I, I, I would take it, for many of us. Jesus is breaking social protocols, speaking to a woman in public. Even worse, a Samaritan woman, and even worse still, a loose Samaritan woman. And as they speak, the subject of their conversation turns to the subject of worship. And the first thing to notice about how to truly worship God is that without Jesus, forget it. Have a look at verse 10. Jesus said to her in verse 10, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. 
Uh, her response indicates that she thinks Jesus is talking about the wet stuff. It's only when Jesus reveals a supernatural knowledge about her past that she realises she's talking to someone special, a prophet. The uh, Samaritans expected a prophet like Moses to come, who would settle the uh, controversial question, where should people go if they want to meet with God? Is it on Mount Gerizim, where the Samaritans had built a temple, or is it in Jerusalem, as the Jews believed? Jesus answers, reveals a time when mountains are overrated. Verse 21, he says, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. God did choose the temple in Jerusalem as the place to focus his presence with his people, but that was about to change. Verse 23, a time is coming, said Jesus, and it's now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. It's not about any one place. It's about the time. What time? What hour is Jesus referring to here? And as you read John's Gospel, it's clear that the coming hour, the, the time, is about Jesus' death and resurrection, his return to the Father. And when this takes place, the new temple is raised up and the Spirit is given. The thing about holy mountains is you go up there, you, know, you worship God up there in the mountain, and what happens when you come down? When you go back into life, back to work, back to daily activities, is that worship? In the old system, it can't be, even though they had the Ten Commandments to follow God's law. The place of worship was exactly that, a place. Whereas the worship Jesus is speaking about is the internal reality of living water, the life-giving spirit, which means people can relate to God because God is spirit. Shall we go up to the house of the Lord to seek him? Jesus is saying there are no places, no special mountains, no shrines, no temples, no mosques, no churches. God's people for generations went up to the temple at Jerusalem to meet with God but the Old Testament prophets spoke of a time when the Messiah, God's son would come to earth and would change everything and with Jesus now present there are no special places just a special person so the woman says I know the Messiah is coming and when he comes he will explain everything and Jesus said to her, I speak to you and he. It's about a special person who fulfills all that went before. Most cricket tragics know where to find out about Don Bradman. Where you can see his bat, his gloves, his cricket jumper, his cap. You can see a video of him watching him practice with a cricket stump and a ball against the tank. And you can see him where he gets out for a duck in his last innings. But just imagine for a moment he came back to life and went on a tour around Australia and he arrived in Alberston to run a coaching clinic for cricket. And if you wanted to get up close and get to know him, get the hot tips on the batting, get the forward defence right, the cover drive, all of that, I suppose you could go to the museum. You might do that. There is in Alberston. And if you could get up close with the Don and talk with him and have lunch with him and learn from him, that's the thing to do, isn't it? You want the real experience of meeting the Don. And you see, with Jesus comes the reality. And if you want to meet 
with God and know God and worship God, we don't go to a special place. We must come to a special person, to Jesus, who rose from death. And through him, we have direct, ongoing, personal relationship with the true and living God, which is exactly what we need. If you want to truly worship God, or without Jesus, forget it. But then without the Holy Spirit to truly worship God, forget it. But Jesus in verse 24 says, God is spirit and those who worship, uh, and, the, and his worshippers must worship in spirit. In, um, in spirit could mean the human spirit, that is the sort of inner me, uh, the, in which case Jesus is saying that uh, true worship is not about the um, externals but about the heart, which is true. But Jesus is saying more than that. We need God's spirit to live for Christ with Jesus as Lord. And that is we must be born from above. They're born of his Holy Spirit who convicts us and convinces us of the truth so that we stop worshipping ourselves. We stop living for ourselves as if we are God. I stop living for my own desires or my own comforts or ambitions and live for Jesus, my King, submitting to him. That's what it takes to be a true worshipper. You see, if it was left up to me, I wouldn't be a true worshipper. There would be more chance of me cheering on manly sea eagles in the National Rugby League than to be a true worshipper of God. Because, you see, I was brought up in the western suburbs of Sydney and I only discovered what the North Shore was and the Northern Beaches were when I was in grade 7 at school. I was sitting there in a group of other students and the housemaster at the school looked at me one day and he asked me, would you stand up, please, on the spot? I might have been not paying attention to him or something, I don't know. He got me to stand up. I'd like you to give a five-minute talk on the fascinating subject of the North Shore and Northern Beaches of Sydney. Well, I knew about Manly. I knew that that was part of that area because I remembered as a kid somewhere reading about the Manly Women's Bowling Club which, you just think about that for a minute, it's quite sounds quite strange, doesn't it? So, I, I, I began with that. Otherwise, I didn't have much of a clue about it. I'm just not interested in the North Shore, it's in my blood or DNA. You see, if it's left up to me, I, I won't worship or serve or submit to Jesus as Lord. I, I won't live for him. We can, we can only worship the Father by the Spirit, which is why Jesus came to earth to die and to rise again, to give God's Spirit, to, to make us the true worshippers of God when we believe the gospel of his dear Son. Anyone can turn up and pretty easily on a Sunday morning and say some prayers, sing some songs. We can say some words from a creed, perhaps, I believe in God the Father. But true worship is not just the words, it's what our lives are about. For I show what I really think about Jesus by the way that I live how I live for Christ in my family, how I live for Christ with the members of the club I belong to, how I live for Christ in the place where I work or in the car. 
I need the Spirit of God to help me, convict me and change me. How do you worship God through Christ if by nature the desire isn't there? You need a miracle to truly worship. A miracle of grace. Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3 that no one will see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. That's the miracle from God from above. When Jesus says, worship in spirit, it describes the person who lives with Jesus as Lord of your life. It describes how the spirit of God draws people to Christ to empower us to keep submitting to Jesus Christ as Lord and to hear his word, to love his word. Let's not confuse religion with true worship. It's possible to be baptised with water, possible to take the Lord's Supper regularly, possible to sing our Christian songs and yet never to have begun to worship God. The Spirit of God must change the heart. Has he done that for you? Do you have affection, love for Jesus, love for God your Father? Do you know this? in your life. If, if not, then please pray that God would work that miracle in your life. Give you the new birth, the spirit Jesus speaks about. Without the Holy Spirit, forget it. And then, thirdly, without the truth, forget it. Are there other ways to worship God apart from Jesus Christ? What about all the other religions of the world? They might be very sincere in that worship, dedicated to it. A Christian is the only people to offer God true worship, and that's what Jesus is saying. He, we worship in spirit and truth. Doesn't Jesus refer to himself as the truth? There's only one mediator between God and man. No other name under heaven given to mankind by which we're saved. No one comes to the Father except through him. He is the narrow way. He's not just one road among many to take. In him alone is God's saving revelation to us and his redemption of us. He makes true worship possible because he shows us what God is really like. We don't worship a God we make up. We worship the true God revealed fully in his son, Jesus. Other religions of the world on earth have people speculating about what God is like. Christianity isn't based on speculation. It begins in heaven. God takes the initiative to reach out to us in his truth. As Jesus is revealed to us in God's word, we understand we are under God's judgment and we need rescue from it. We need a redeemer. Jesus, who brings us back into relationship with God by taking our sin upon himself at the cross. And that's why he told the woman, a time is coming. He died to make us God's worshippers. So go on hearing the truth about Jesus. Worship never begins with us. It's always a response to the truth. But how do I worship God properly without being reminded of the truth and challenged by the truth? God's truth from his word should fuel at my daily worship of him. Here then are our foundations for true worship. 
through Jesus Christ who reveals God to us, who redeems his people. We cannot respond to him unless we hear his truth. But that's even not enough. For we will keep ignoring his truth unless God's Holy Spirit enables us to respond. God the Spirit uses his truth, his word, to draw us to Christ, to make us his worshippers in a life of worship. Jesus said, a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. That's how Jesus did it. He came into the world at the right time. He worshipped the Father in spirit and truth. He gave perfect worship. He gave his life in perfect obedience through death on the cross. He provides that perfect worship for us in heaven. The Father greatly desired that worship. And through it, the Father brings people who trust in Jesus into his family, born of his spirit, knowing his truth. Has the Father found you? Through the great worship given by Jesus, the Father seeks people who worship him. And when our trust is in Christ Jesus, we will give God true worship in spirit and truth. It will be vital to you, of great value. You will want to know Jesus more. You will want the truth about Jesus to be known more and more by others. You will know his spirit pointing you to Jesus so that you will live for Jesus. That's the true kind of worshippers the Father seeks. She said, thanks anyway. And I said, look, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not sure of the way to Southern Cross Station. And I paused. could I tell you something that I am sure about? What would you say? Like Jesus, could you point someone to something that you are sure about? To the Father who is seeking true worshippers. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for that privilege of calling you Father. And through the work of Jesus, the perfect worship of Jesus, we are able to draw near with confidence by faith. And so, Lord, we are just recipients of this great mercy, this great adoption as your children today. What a great blessing this is. And so, Lord, we pray that by your spirit, knowing who Jesus is in the truth, that you might indeed give us all the courage and the boldness to speak, to share of what it is we are sure about in the gospel of your Son. And so, Lord, please... Continue to work in us and through us that we might bring you great praise. Give you our lives and worship day by day. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue in a time of prayer and uh, Ellie will come and lead us. Thank you, Ellie.